Hi. Um, I'll try not to delay the beer too much. Um, I know people want to go away, so. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, software and our software commons and how we try to preserve software and how we are struggling with lots of tiny, tiny, tiny files, billions and billions of tiny files. So, so most of us are developers, uh, so we know that source code is kind of special. It's like at this intersection between uh, human readable and machine readable. So it's like a lot of the knowledge that we have in computers is encoded in source code. So we have some pieces of really clever stuff that's done with uh, source code. And we have some stuff that's like really pervasive and that makes the internet work. The source code provides a view into the mind of the developer. This, the commons are basically the resources that are available to everyone. And specifically software uh, and free software, uh, what we develop, basically it's available for everyone, but it's really precious, but what are we doing to preserve it? We know that bits are really fragile. Uh, digital information disappears all the time. Um, we can lose code uh, either uh, maliciously. Uh, someone removes uh, your VM in the cloud and then your data is gone. Um, or the people who host your code don't care anymore about hosting your code because you don't bring in any money. So the business shut does, shuts down. Or, well, uh, if you don't have the code uh, that lives any longer and you just let it sit on hard drives or floppy disks or DVDs, it rots and it disappears. Where is the archive we go to if some piece of code has disappeared? What if GitHub goes away tomorrow? What do we do? So that's why we're trying to build uh, with software heritage. Our mission is to collect, preserve, and share the source code of all the software that's publicly available. Looking back to the past, thinking and enhancing the present to prepare for the future. So we're building the base infrastructure to have this huge library of source code and make it available for cultural heritage, for industry, for research, for the education. And we do it in the open. We do it with free software, we do it transparently, everything is done on a public forge that anyone can look at. And we're trying to do it for the long haul. Uh, we're trying to do it, uh, so we're doing it as a non-profit entity. Uh, and we want the core of the things that we do to be replicatable, so every, anybody with enough resources can help us achieve this goal of having our digital commons preserved forever. How do we do that? Well, we've started uh, and we're focusing on the source code. So our targets are version control repositories. Uh, and source code releases, uh, tables, because lots of the historic things that we can find are uh, available uh, as releases. So we do archive contents, uh, revisions, with, most of the meta with all the metadata that we can find, uh, releases, uh, and of course, we keep track of where and when we found all of this software. And we're doing that in a model that is trying to be as generic and as agnostic as possible uh, with respect to the version control system. So we take Git, we take Subversion, we're working on Mercurial, uh, we're working on tables, and we keep everything in one single big graph. We don't archive the home pages, the issues, the bug tracking systems, the mailing lists, um, because we had to start with something. Uh, 
and we thought that like source code was the key to enabling, uh, well, uh, building the semantic wiki of software where you can cross-reference uh, source code between repositories and add metadata about uh, how it was developed. So we're really starting uh, at the foundations. So our data flow is pretty simple. Uh, we have our origins on the left, uh, which are uh, source code uh, hosting platforms, uh, distributions, uh, language-specific um, platforms to distribute code. And we list them uh, once in a while, uh, and we get lists of packages that are interesting to look at, lists of, lists of projects that we want to archive. This is the set of software origins that we are loading regularly in our archive. And the archive uh, is fully deduplicated, which means that if you have a source code file that's available on GitHub, in Debian, in Ubuntu, in Fedora, and in a bunch of, like, for instance, in yeah, CPAN, because, well, there's a lot of Perl everywhere, um, we're going to only keep one copy of it. But we're going to link it to all the origins that we've found it in. So we do that uh, using a construct that you all, you all know because it's used, it's underlying git, it's a Merkle tree. So basically uh, you do this hierarchy of, you have the contents at the bottom, that's the source code files, and then the contents are in directories that are themselves referenced in other directories, so you get a tree of source code. And then when you do revisions of this source code, each time you point to a new directory. So this structure is fully deduplicated, which means that we have at the end and at the far end of this archive, we have, um, I think this is like up to date as of a week ago, uh, we have 3 billion 700 million uh, unique source code files that are archived across 800 million revisions that are uh, listed from 65 million projects. So that's a big graph. How big? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> How do you decide which project you get from GitHub, for example, because the majority of them don't have a license allowing them we, you to copy them or? We don't decide what we get. We get everything. Um, the idea is that we're in it for the really long term. So in the end, it will become public domain and we can redistribute it. <laughs> so yeah, uh, we're working on uh, making sure that uh, the things that we redistribute, uh, we redistribute legally, uh, but we keep everything. Yes. Uh, did you ever uh, hit rate limiting from GitHub or Bilbaquet? Uh, GitHub doesn't really do rate limiting. Uh, well, they do rate limiting on their API. Uh, we just have more accounts. Uh, that's, so uh, Git, GitHub is actually a sponsor of the project uh, and it's their advertised way of doing things. Uh, just ask people for more tokens and then you can parallelize. Okay. Um, are you backing up SourceForge before it dies? <laughs> um, we're looking into it. Um, yeah. So what we've built is, we think, the richest source code archive already, and it's growing daily. And, well, that's a lot of nodes, that's a lot of files, that's even a lot of raw data. Uh, how do you store all of this on a limited budget? So, uh, we've started uh, with our prototype, uh, that's what we're working on right now, uh, with around 50,000 euros of budget and for hardware. And yeah, do whatever you can with that. So we have some big machine, uh, which is not that big. It's only one big machine. And a lot of spinning rust uh, that's plugged at the back of this machine. 
Uh, for the metadata, we've used Postgres, and what we've decided to do is to do the simplest thing and just store the files one by one on the file system. The idea is that um, this is the easiest way that we can recover a file if something screws up, um, if we have a bug in our system, if we just write a file, it's really easy to make sure that the file is still intact and that you can recover it and that you can mirror it. So we split uh, our storage in two. Uh, basically, we have the metadata with, with all the graph and then the object storage, which is like what's interesting to us because it's basically a stress test of file systems in Linux. Uh, how do you store uh, 4 billion inodes on a single system? So we've started with some bad assumptions about how uh, Linux file systems work. Uh, we could have done better, uh, we should have done better. So what we've did is we've sharded, so we've split the files uh, distributed by hash. So they're basically uh, evenly distributed. Um, and we've done a bunch of partitions. We've chosen XFS because when you resize XFS, you get new inodes, so that's great, which is not the case with X4, um, which was kind of problematic when we started because we knew we had a ballpark estimate of how many files we would need, but really no like concrete idea of just how large this thing would be. Um, and uh, ooh, having lots of files in the directory is a problem, so we're going to split those files up into a lot of directories. Um, so what we've, did, we've, what we've done is splitting the directories uh, in a 256-wide, uh, 3-level deep uh, hierarchy. So basically 16 million uh, directories, uh, a million directories per partition, uh, which, well, um, it sucks. Uh, it really sucks. Uh, we, have, we are backed by slow storage uh, on a storage array that we don't have a lot of control on, and our infrastructure is limited. We don't have a lot of RAM because we want our database to have lots of RAM, so our file storage server doesn't have a lot of RAM. So we get bad performance. Uh, basically, when you have the 16 million directory inodes and you have that in cache, you don't have any memory space left. So what we're gonna do uh, for the main copy of our archive is actually moving to a scale out system, a plain object storage like Ceph or Swift or whatever. Uh, but the thing is, we want this data to be accessible, and we want this data to uh, be available to like research teams with limited budgets, and uh, we want them to be able to play with the archive and do research on it, and use it, and mirror it, and we really don't want to say, hey, so the entry ticket is 100,000 euros, you need a full rack full of machines with fast disks and SSDs, and well, yeah, that's what you have to do, so suck it up. So we've been looking at how we can try to do better uh, with plain file systems, and basically, uh, we had to fix our wrong assumptions. Yeah, it turns out that directly lookups aren't linear anymore. Uh, there's some hash lookups uh, that can speed up uh, directory accesses. And so if you really look at how uh, it's implemented, uh, you can find out that having a few million uh, entries per directory is not that bad of an idea any longer. So you can do that. And you can have way less directories. Uh, if you do some stupid things like storing shorter file names, then you can have even more entries because uh, the size of the hash table is limited, but there's the file name in it. So yeah, you can do some things. Did we try it out? No, because we don't have enough slack and don't have enough like spare hardware to try it. Uh, we're gonna work on that uh, very soon. Uh, that's like the project that we're going to do uh, during the year is like making this scale, uh, making our archive scale forever. 
So if you if you're interested in playing with that, uh, you can join us. We have a page for developers uh, that are interested with mailing list. Uh, we have a forge uh, that's open and that everyone uh, can look at and report bugs in and tell us what interesting software you know that's in SourceForge and that you don't want to lose or that's anywhere else and that you want us to keep. There's, very, there's a lot of things that you can come and help us do. A lot of organizations are sharing our vision. Uh, all those organizations have given us quotes of support. Uh, some organizations are sponsoring us. We're really thankful to INRIA, uh, which is a French institute for computer science research, um, which hosts uh, the team and hosts the hardware and gave the initial uh, impulse to get this going. Um, so we are building a reference archive of all the free and open source software ever written. Uh, we want it to be a complement to development platforms. As an international open and non-profit infrastructure that can be mutualized at the service of our community and at the service of society at large. So yeah, if you want to like talk and uh, contribute, uh, don't hesitate to, like, yeah, don't hesitate to do so. Uh, we've published a, a white paper uh, that's been presented today uh, at the IPRESS, which is the big digital preservation conference. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of, like, detailed info on why we do this and how we do it uh, is present on the paper if you want more details. Thank you. I don't know how much more we can delay <laughs> the beer, but if there's any questions. There's a bunch of questions in the back. <clears throat> how do you deal with five, will difference five be the same checksum? Sorry? How do you deal? Yes, so how do we deal with different files with the same checksum? We have more checksums. So uh, basically our storage today is keyed on the SHA-1 of the file. So when we have a second file with the same SHA-1, which apparently happens, um, we just try and say, hey, there's another file with the same SHA-1, but different hashes. So yeah, we are migrating to like new hashes. Uh, so we have, we have just completed uh, recomputing all the checksums for all the files using Blake2. Um, and then already uh, when we started, we used SHA-1, the SHA-1 as Git does, so with, with SALT and SHA-256. So yeah. Uh, and of course, we know that collisions on hashes will happen again. And so we just need to keep on updating the data model to make sure that we just keep ahead. There was some questions in the back. You can proxy to me. Um, I have a question regarding your policy not to, I'd say, back up the documentation and all the pages that could come with a project because um, source code in, its, in itself is not sufficient if you don't know how to use it, know how to build it, uh, in which case you can use it because I can take the example of some projects I'm working on. We are tied to a really specific uh, GCC build with custom patches and so on. Um, if you don't uh, back up the documentation with the source code, your source code is just useless. So will you, at the end, think about backupping all the metadata or? So uh, we agree that just backing up source code is not enough. Um, however, uh, I disagree that source code is useless without the documentation. Uh, source code is the encoding of the algorithm. 
your documentation doesn't encode the algorithm. Your source code does. Um, of course, I mean, um, it's interesting to see how uh, someone implemented something, even though you cannot reproduce the results that they've, ha they've achieved. However, I do agree that it's really important uh, to build, like, to get, uh, um, well, to archive uh, the documentation, the, um, well, everything that goes around just source code. Um, we've decided to start with source code. Uh, if there are resources that are put into archiving more than source code, we're really happy to help. Um, yeah, we have to start somewhere. Yeah, hi. Um, I was wondering if you have looked at the IPFS project, because some of the things you mentioned, like Merkle DAGs and the idea of, of storing things permanently, um, they are working on that too. You're taking a different approach, which is storing everything locally. They're trying to do the super distributed file system, which stores everything everywhere. Um, but there might be a common ground to find and something to do with them. So I was just wondering. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I mean, I think IPFS was quoted in the slide about Merkle DAGs. I'm sorry, I didn't uh, say that. I, yeah, I didn't mention it. But yeah, that's one of the projects that we were looking at. And yeah, that, I think there's some. Uh, I areas. see you have several loaders from various. Um, Yep. different type of uh, input sources. Do you consider to save some software that we are not yet able to decompile like firmware? Because if we keep the binary version, maybe later on, we'll be able to get the way to extract at least what's inside or maybe save it for later. Right. Like CPU microcodes or stuff like that. So uh, we have decided to focus on source code. Um, I guess uh, we are not looking too closely at what constitutes source code, uh, which means that if you have a Git repository somewhere uh, with binary files, uh, they're in the archive. Um, the thing is, what we really want to keep and we want this to be, uh, so we want our archive to be like comprehensible by humans in a hundred years, in a thousand years. And the source code is clearly the key, uh, like the knowledge is in the source code. In a hundred years, you won't be able to run the firmware that comes in like a crappy Wi-Fi card or uh, any any of the embedded devices that we are running today. But this is about knowledge. The way you are fixing a CPU, to, a CPU today using a CPU firmware update is about something, not, uh, it's a software update to, some, to a software uh, package. And this may, we, may have some interest at understanding how they did it. We are really happy to, for Intel to upload the VHDL files for their, com, for their uh, CPUs and uh, the source for their uh, firmwares. And so the Linux firmware... We, we, have, we have to set the line somewhere. Uh, so we've set the line at source code. I know it was borderline question. Of course, uh, given infinite resources, we can always do more. Uh, the Internet Archive does a lot of work uh, on uh, archiving binaries and making sure that you can keep running binaries uh, that have been released 30, 40 years ago. And they're doing a great job at it. Uh, so, yeah, I think we can collaborate. Uh, I used to use XFS a long time ago on my laptop because uh, it's... Uh, really solid file system in my opinion. But uh, when I started to use Git a lot, I noticed that it was extremely slow, like uh, one minute to run a Git status. And uh, it took me quite some time to figure that uh, XFS has some, uh, sort, some shortcomings. I don't remember the details anymore, to be honest. But it has some shortcomings with uh, dealing with many small files uh, compared to very large files. And that's probably something you should uh, reconsider. Right, uh, yeah, I, I can only agree with that. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.
Uh, so in case you did not, did not have, have enough today, we see you tomorrow. And for those going to the Gandhi Apero, maybe uh, you can go there together because we have some guys not knowing a lot, Paris uh, subway and things, things like that. So uh, we see you there. Don't forget your badge if you are going there, okay? See you. and I haven't done a conference with it, so I'm all nervous about the... Maybe they turn it off. Looks like maybe they turn it off. You want to, did you want to test it too? Yeah, I, I need an uh, adapter in order to be able to test it. So I think I have to. Oh, you need the you need oh, that one's mine. You need the mini uh, HD or mini. Uh, is that micro HDMI there? Or mini HDMI? No, that's DisplayPort. I think there's both actually. Yeah, you, that's, that's DisplayPort, but I think you need yeah, yeah, the, the, the mini HDMI or I don't know if it's micro. She claims she has one, one, so I'll. I'll <laughs> Maybe it's easier. To Actually, you know what? I might even have one too. That, that's yeah. uh. Oh yeah, that's the mini. Oh, that's. The, what's that? It must be that one. Yeah. My, it's it's micro HD. Micro HDMI. I might actually have that. Yeah. If uh, Kevin has some left. What are you doing with those two? Sorry, no. Anyway, see you tomorrow? Yeah, oh, you're not coming tonight? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. See you tomorrow.